Hi everyone and welcome to this new lecture, which will be a tribute to Euler the Incredible Genius. The Swiss mathematician revolutionized mathematics in the 18th century, and we will see in this first part how he proved Fermat's Little Theorem, and how he did prove that every even perfect number is of the Euclidean form. Fasten your seat belts, it's gonna be a bumpy ride. Euler was actually the first to prove Fermat's claim, and he did it in a different way from the one I gave in the previous lecture. Let me remind you that we would like to prove that a powers p is congruent to a modulo p whenever p is a prime number and a is any integer. To do this, Euler recognized the pattern, which is that a plus 1 powers p minus a p plus 1 is divisible by p, which means it is congruent to 0 modulo p all the time. Said in other terms, a plus 1 powers p will always have the same remainder modulo p of a powers p plus 1. Now before proving this, let us check it on some examples. If for instance we take a equals to 2 and p equals to 3, which is a prime number, then 2 plus 1, which is a plus 1 powers 3, is equal to 3 powers 3, which is 27, and 27 modulo 3 is congruent to 0 modulo p. Now if you check a to the p plus 1, this gives 2 powers 3 plus 1, which is congruent to 8 plus 1 modulo 3, and this is congruent to 9 modulo 3, which is also 0 modulo 3. So for p equals 3 and a equals to 2, this result holds. I wrote a little computer program in Python to check whether this is true all the time or not. So my program here will return whether x is equal to y or not. And if I run this with conk test, which means congruence test of 2 for a and 3 as a prime number, we get it true here, which means that both x and y will give the same result modulo p. You can check this for many more examples, for instance, at random if you take 4 and 29 as a prime number, we also get it true too. So this would help us to conjecture that the result is true all the time, which we will prove together here. To do this, Euler used the binomial theorem which states that a plus b powers n is equal to n choose 0 a to the n b to the 0 plus n choose 1 a to the n minus 1 b powers 1 plus n choose 2 a to the n minus 2 b squared until we get to n choose n a powers 0 b powers n. And this is actually a generalization of a plus b all squared which is equal to a squared plus 2 a b plus b squared. And here we know that n choose 0 is equal to 1, 2 choose 1 is equal to 2 of course, and 2 choose choose 2 is equal to 1, thus the formula for a plus b all squared. We can also apply this to get that a plus b all cubed is the same thing as a cubed plus 3a squared b plus 3ab squared plus b cubed. I hope that all of you know about the binomial coefficients which is more generally equal to n choose k is n factorial divided by k factorial all multiplied by n minus k factorials. Euler used this theorem here and expanded a plus 1 powers p, which is equal to a powers p plus p choose 1 a powers p minus 1, and this is because b here is equal to 1, so the terms b powers 1, b powers 2 will vanish, and thus we get plus p choose 2 a powers p minus 2 until we get here p choose p which is equal to 1 times 1 here. Now if we rearrange this we get a to the p plus 1 plus p choose 1 a powers p minus 1 plus p choose 2 a powers p minus 2 until we get to p choose p minus 1 times a. Now to see that a plus 1 powers p is congruent to a to the p plus 1, all we have to do is to prove that this number here is divisible by p. For this purpose we will prove that if k is strictly greater than 0, 
and lesser are equal to p minus 1, then p must divide p choose k. But first, let us do this on a concrete example. When p is equal to 3, we get that 3 choose 1 is equal to 3 factorial all divided by 1 factorial times 3 minus 1 factorials, which is equal to 3 factorial all divided by 2 factorial, and this is equal to 3 times 2 factorial all divided by 2 factorial, which is equal to 3. And 3 is divisible by 3. Now, 3 choose 2 is equal to 3 factorials all divided by 2 factorials times 3 minus 2 factorials. And this is actually the same thing as the one here because it gives 3 factorials divided by 2 factorials times 1 factorials. And this is also equal to 3. Now, for instance, if p is equal to 5, then 5 choose 1 is equal to 5 factorials divided by 1 factorial times 4 factorials and this is equal to 5 which is divisible by 5 and actually you can show that n choose 1 will always be equal to n so it is divisible by n now 5 choose 2 is equal to 5 factorials divided by 2 factorials times 3 factorials and this is equal to 5 times 4 all divided by 2 which is 5 times 2 and 5 times 2 is divisible by 5 same thing here 5 choose 3 will be equal to 5 factorials divided by 2 divided by 3 factorials times 2 factorials same thing it is equal to 5 times 2 which is divisible by 5 last one is 5 choose 4 which is equal to 5 factorials all divided by 1 factorial times 4 factorials it is the same thing as here which is equal to 5 divisible by 5 i hope now that you almost see what happens and if not take more examples and the pattern will be clearer to you let us now get to the general proof to see why this works, all we have to notice that k factorials times p choose k is equal to k factorials times p factorials all divided by k factorials times p minus k factorial. And this is p factorial divided by p minus k factorial. This is actually equal to p times p minus 1 factorial all divided by p minus k factorials. And we see easily that if k is greater or equal to 1, then this number here will be an integer, which means that k factorial times p choose k is divisible by p. Hence, p divides k factorial times p choose k, but p cannot divide k factorials, and this is because k is between between 1 and p minus 1 which means by the Gaussian lemma that p must divide p choose k and this is the desired result now we know that a plus 1 powers p will always be congruent to a powers p plus 1 modulo p and let me remind you that we would like to prove that for every a a to the p will be congruent to a modulo p to prove this, actually, Euler used induction, and he supposed if a to the p for a positive integer a is congruent to a modulo p, then this will give us by induction that it is congruent to a plus 1 modulo p, which means that he proved if a to the p is congruent to a modulo p, then it implies that a plus 1 powers p will be congruent to a plus 1 modulo p. Now all we have to do to complete the induction is to verify this for a equals to 0 and this is actually a trivial fact because 0 powers p will always be congruent to 0 modulo p for every prime p. Bingo! So this proves Fermi's little theorem for positive integers a and I'll leave it to you to prove it for negative integers. And this is only the beginning of a great adventure in the brilliant mind of Euler. Now we prove Euler's claim about perfect numbers, which is if n is a perfect number that is even, then n must be of the Euclidean form, which means that n can be written as 2 powers n all times 2 to the n minus 1, where 2 to the n minus 1 is a prime number p. Before we dive in technical details, let me highlight some important historical facts about Euler. Actually, when he was very young, he had no interest in number theory until he met in St. Petersburg the great German mathematician Christian Goldbach. 
it is Christian Goldbach who brought to his attention Fermer's work about number theory. From that moment to now, we owe a lot of number theoretical advances to his eminence, Leonhard Euler. Now, to prove his claim, Euler introduced a new number theoretical function that we call here sigma of n, which is equal to the sum of all the divisors of n, including n itself. This is actually a little bit different from what Euclid did, because Euclid considered only proper divisors of n, which means he always excluded n itself. Euler goes on to n itself for reasons that we will discover together. Now if you try this with 6, we have that sigma of 6 is equal to 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 6 itself, which is equal to 12. If you try this with 7, sigma of 7 is equal to 1 plus 7, and this is 8. So you can notice here that I include n itself, 6 here and 7 for this example. And if you check sigma, for instance, of 28, which is a perfect number, you will find that it is 2 times 28, which is is equal to 56. I couldn't help but write a little computer program to do the job for me and compute sigma for every integer n and here I have a function which I call divisors of n which returns the list of divisors of n and I defined a second function which is sigma of n that sums all the divisors of n. Now if I try my function here with sigma of 6 for instance 1 gets 12 which is the desired result. Sigma of 28 same thing here is 56. Sigma of 7 yields 8. Great. Now what it is incredible is that Euler characterized prime numbers and perfect numbers using his new function as follows. First of all, a number n is perfect if and only if sigma of n is equal to 2 times n. Second claim, a number p is prime if and only if sigma of p is equal to p plus 1. So now our problems are equivalent of relations about the function sigma. So to study these problems, Euler studied our function sigma and dressed some important properties about it. First one is, if p is a prime number, then sigma of p to the r is equal to p to the r plus 1 minus 1 all divided by p minus 1. Second claim is that sigma has a multiplicative property which means that if p and q are different primes then sigma of p times q is the same thing as sigma of p times sigma of q. Interesting right? Now last thing is, which is actually a generalization of this one here, if A and B are co-prime numbers, which means their greatest common divisor is equal to 1, then we have that sigma of A times B is equal to sigma of A times sigma of B. So we see here that the key notion of the multiplicative property of sigma is not being prime, but being co-prime. Let us prove the first claim, which means if p is a prime number, then sigma to the p to the r is equal to p to the r plus 1 minus 1, all divided by p minus 1. This is actually a trivial fact because the only divisors of p to the r are of the form p to the t, where t is an integer between 0 and r, so we get that sigma of p to the r is equal to 1 plus p plus p squared until we get to p to the r, and this is a geometric series that sums to p to the r plus 1 minus 1 all divided by p minus 1, and this was actually straightforward. As an application to this, we have that sigma of 2 to the r is equal to 2 to the r plus 1 minus 1 all divided by 2 minus 1, which is equal to 2 to the r plus 1 minus 1, and this is 2 times 2 to the r minus 1, which if we denote 2 to the r capital N, this is 2 times capital N minus 1. This means that 2 to the r can never be perfect. And you know why? Because a perfect number verifies the equality sigma of n is equal to 2 times n, which is not the case here. Can you see now how incredible Euler's function is? And this is just the beginning. Now we prove our second claim, which is if p and q are different prior numbers, then sigma of p times q is equal to sigma of p times sigma of q. 
Before we prove this, let us try it on Python. So here I computed sigma of 7, and now if I compute sigma of another prime number, say sigma of 5, 1 gets 6. Now sigma of 5 times 7 is equal to 48, which is actually 8 times 6, meaning sigma of 7 times sigma of 5. I suggest you computer program this and try another examples to be convinced. Let us now move on to the proof. I claim that the proof to this is also a straightforward matter and this is because the only divisors of p times q when p and q are different primes are 1, p, q and p times q itself. This means that sigma of p times q is 1 plus p plus q plus p times q and we recognize here actually p plus 1 all times q plus 1. Let me remind you if p is a prime number then sigma of p is equal to p plus 1 which is that this is equal to sigma of p times sigma of q beautiful right what we have to understand here is that nobody before Euler got to this and that is because they did not define the right tool to prove these claims about number theory so it is all about inventing the right tool that fits in correctly the problems until they get solved I'll leave it to you now to prove this last claim which can be deduced from the first two. Now as an application to this, one could compute very easily sigma of any number, say for instance sigma here of 90, it is equal to sigma of 2 cubed times 3 times 5 because the prime factorization of 90 is 2 cubed times 3 times 5 and from this third claim here one gets that this is equal to sigma of 2 cubed times sigma of 3 all times sigma of 5. Now sigma of 2 cubed is equal to 2 to the fourth minus 1, 3 is a prime number so sigma 3 is equal to 4 and 5 is another prime number so sigma of 5 is equal to 6 so we get here 15 times 24 which is after a quick computation is equal to 360 as easy as that so the sum of the divisors of 90 is equal to 360 and we did this only using the properties of sigma without even looking for the divisors of 90 amazing I claim that we're now ready to prove that n is an even perfect number if and only if it is of the Euclidean form which means that we can write it as 2 to the n times 2 to the n minus 1 where 2 to the n minus 1 is a prime number. So we would like to show that if n is even and perfect then n must be of the form 2 to the n minus 1 all times 2 to the n minus 1. Oops actually I made a little mistake here here, and I hope you notice it before me it is actually 2 to the n minus 1 here okay let us now go to real things now because n is even one can write n of the form 2 powers n minus 1 times a certain integer k and this integer k can be chosen odd which means that we take here the greatest power of 2 that divides capital N Notice that n will be strictly greater than 1 and this is because n is even. So now because n is perfect we know that sigma of this n here is equal to 2 times n which is equal to 2 times 2 to the n minus 1 times k and this is 2 to the n times k. Moreover 2 to the n minus 1 and k are co-prime which means they do not share any common divisors and this is because n minus 1 is the greatest power of 2 divided in n we get that sigma of n is also equal to sigma of 2 to the n minus 1 times k which is equal to sigma to the 2 to the n minus 1 all times sigma of k and this is due to our property about co-prime numbers and the function sigma and we know from the first property that this is equal to 2 to the n minus 1 all times sigma of k so from these two one gets that that 2 to the n times k is equal to 2 to the n minus 1 times sigma of k. Now I wrote things down again here and what Euler could deduce from this was that 2 to the n must divide 2 to the n minus 1 all times sigma of k but since 2 to the n cannot divide 2 to the n minus 1 this implies that 2 to the n must divide sigma of k itself which means that sigma of k is equal to a certain integer 
integer b times 2 to the k. From here and here, Euler also deduces that 2 to the n times k is equal to 2 to the n minus 1 times b times 2 to the k, which yields that k itself is equal to, I'm sorry, this is actually 2 to the n, and this 2 is 2 to the n, and this yields that k is equal to b times 2 to the n minus 1. Let me remind you that what I'm doing here, if you're a little bit lost, that I would like to write n in the form 2 to the n minus 1 all times 2 to the n minus 1. What I did here is that I wrote n as 2 to the n minus 1 times a certain integer k, and I would like to show that k is of the form 2 to the n minus 1, which means that I would like to show that b is equal to 1. So what I know now is that k is equal to a certain integer b times 2 to the n minus 1, and we would like to show that b is equal to 1, in which case 2 to the n minus 1 must be a prime number. So we suppose here that b is strictly greater than 1, which will lead us to a contradiction. First of all, notice that the divisors of k here are 1, b, 2 to the n minus 1, and k itself. I claim that these four divisors are all different. And to prove this, we will prove that they are pairwise different. So first case is that k cannot be equal to 1, which is impossible because in such a case, capital N will be equal to 2 powers n minus 1 times k, which will be 2 powers n minus 1 because k is equal to 1. And we've seen previously that a power of 2 cannot be a perfect number. So this is impossible and k is different from 1. Second case now is that b is different from 1. This this is obvious because we're supposing that b is strictly greater than 1. Case 3, 2 to the n minus 1 cannot be equal to 1 because otherwise we would have 2 to the n is equal to 2 which yields that 2 to the n minus 1 is equal to 1 and this implies that capital N is equal to 2 to the n minus 1 times k which is equal to k and this cannot hold because k is an odd integer and that we supposed in our theorem that n is an even perfect number. Now we show that k cannot be equal to b because otherwise we would have that b is equal to b times 2 to the n minus 1 and this would imply that 2 to the n minus 1 is equal to 1 which yields that 2 to the n is equal to 2 and this is the same case as here which is impossible. It is obvious in this case that k cannot be equal to 2 to the n minus 1 and this is because otherwise b will be equal to 1 which contradicts what we supposed here. Finally, b cannot be equal to 2 to the n minus 1 because otherwise this would give k equals to b squared which means that k has at least three different divisors which are 1, b and b squared and they are different because b is strictly greater than 1 which means in particular that sigma of k is at least equal to 1 plus b plus b squared. But we know that sigma of k actually is equal to b times 2 to the n which is equal to b times 2 to the n minus 1 plus 1 and this is equal to b times b plus 1 because we supposed here that b is equal to 2 to the n minus 1 which is equal to b squared plus b and this is obviously a contradiction because b squared plus b is lesser than 1 plus b plus b squared. Hence, this cannot hold, and we get from there the desired result, which is that 1, b, 2 to the n minus 1, and k itself are four different divisors of k. This actually means that sigma of k is greater than 1 plus b plus 2 to the n minus 1 plus k itself, which is equal to b plus 2 to the n plus k, and this is equal to b plus 2 to the n plus b times 2 to the n minus minus 1 because k is equal to b times 2 to the n minus 1 which is equal to 2 to the n times b plus 1 and this is strictly greater than 2 to the n times b which is let me remind you is equal to sigma of k itself so we proved here that sigma of k is strictly greater than itself which is of course a contradiction bingo so what we proved here is that the claim b strictly greater than 1 cannot hold which means that b must be equal to 1. So if b is equal to 1 then k is equal to 2 
to the n minus 1 and all we have to do now is to prove that 2 to the n minus 1 is a prime number which will finish our proof. Now if b is equal to 1 we have that k is equal to 2 to the n minus 1 and we know from here that sigma of k is equal to 2 to the n times b which is equal to 2 to the n because b is equal to 1 and this is also equal to 2 to the n minus 1 plus 1 and 2 to the n minus 1 is k itself so this is k plus 1 and so we prove that sigma of k is equal to k plus 1 which means let me remind you that k is a prime number bingo now before i let you go i would like to add some important comments this proof wasn't beyond the technical abilities of euclid himself but the only difference here is that euler found the right tool and machinery to get to the desired result by summing all the divisors up to n instead of summing all the divisors of n excluding n as euclid did so it might seem to you that there is no big difference between the two one adds n one excludes excludes n but we've seen in this lecture that this step was decisive to make our problem fall like Newton's apple. Our first lecture about the incredible genius of Euler ends here and do not keep away for a long time because in the next lectures we will discover more of his brilliant ideas. Thank you for listening.